Put this red glaze on this, and then um, after it dries a bit, I will draw some leaves on it with wax. And then um, spray over them, and it gives you kind of a batik looking pattern. Let that dry. Same with the bowl. And then these, which I dipped a couple of minutes ago, I'll just get the last of that on there. I don't mind having a little bit of overlap. It, it goes a different color where it's thicker, so I... So all these will have another other colors sprayed on top of them. Uh, the glaze is composed of, in chemical terms, it's composed of silica, and which is glass, and something to um, melt it and something to stabilize it. But in practical terms, it's it's composed of ground up rock, so feldspathic rock and um, silica based rock and you know different kinds of rock. So you but you get you get bags of chemicals, 50 pound bags of chemicals, and you. Um, weigh them into batches and then get them wet. Um, and most of my, well, all but one of my recipes, not most, all, all but one of my recipes came from another potter, um, different potters. I'm not a glaze, I'm not interested in glaze chemistry per se and I'm not much good at it. So these are borrowed, borrowed recipes. So my glazing process is sort of multi-step. Typically, I do a first coat of something and then I spray on top of it, or I draw on top of it and then spray on top of that, or I draw on top of it and I um, dip on top of that or whatever. There, I, I very rarely just use one glaze all by itself. The only time I use one glaze all by itself is when I have a pot that has a lot of texture and I want to simplify the glaze so that the texture shows. But I, I think it's kind of a waste of an of a opportunity if, if a pot looks the same all the way around. I like it to look different on different sides. So these are the Shaner Red, and that's a glaze that was invented by a, a potter no longer alive named Dave, Dave Shaner. And potters all across America use different variations on this glaze. might be it for the red. I'm going to leave it out for those two. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll do one more uh, berry bowl. Glazing is arguably my least favorite part of making pots. I really, I really don't much care for glazing, which is why for the first 35 or 40 years I made pots, I did a lot of salt glazing, where the kiln does the glazing for you. Um, but I, I don't have, I, I, don't, I don't, don't draw well, I don't paint well, I don't have, I mean I love pots that have uh, decorative things going on, but I'm not inclined to doing that myself, So, which is why I do spraying, because it's a little bit like the salt kiln in that the process gives you the product. Okay, so those are ready, except for those two, to be decorated farther. So I'm going to set them over here, out of the way. Oh, we're just putting down there. 
a, it's a berry bowl and a little plate to go underneath it. So it sits like that on the plate. Um, and, there, and you can see that th there's no glaze on the bottom. There needs to be no glaze on the bottom so it doesn't glaze itself to the shelf. And um, that, I, that, I accomplished that by dipping this in wax, oh, which I did okay. the other day. So the, it shed, the wax sheds the glaze. Yeah. I have a, uh, an old electric frying pan full of hot, um, hot wax, that, and I dip, dip them all. I hear a phone dinging. Is that yours or mine? It's not mine. Okay. The holes in the uh, decorative uh, holes in the, in the berry bowls. Uh huh. They're like little colanders. I use an electric drill, oh. uh, a variable speed electric drill, and then and then um, afterwards I use a little thing called a, cou a countersink to just clean up the edges of the holes. So it's not difficult. It's a little bit, I would say, they're somewhat labor intensive, just in terms of time. But they're not. Are they done at the at the time when the? They're done after I, I so I make the pots and they're wet, and then I wait till they're what's called leather hard and turn them upside down and trim the foot. So this was thrown, you know, without that little decorative foot on it. I turn it upside down and trim it, and then I let it get even firmer before I drill the holes. Because the holes, um, if you do it on, when it's just the right texture to, to trim, it's too wet and they get really goopy. So you have, they have to be fairly, still wet, but fairly dry before you do the, um, drill, drill, drill the holes. One thing about these glazes is that they settle out fairly quickly, so you really need to keep stirring them between dips. Otherwise, the, you get a little thin film of water on the top of the glaze, and then um, it doesn't it doesn't get on at the right thickness. So my firing partner Becky and I mix up these big buckets of glaze and then um, sort of check, the, how, check that they're the right thickness. And once we've checked them, I, I kind of go on faith. I assume that there can still be right. She, she just glazed last week and her pots look good, so I figured they're gonna be fine. But there are ways you can, um, you, can check the, you, can, you can check the specific gravity or there are different ways to calibrate if it's right. When I used to teach classes and I had a bunch of different students using my buckets of glaze, I was more scientific about making sure it was right in the bucket because they didn't have any sense just looking at it of whether or not it looked right. But I, I can tell, usually, <laughs> not always, whether or not it looks like it's going to be right. So that's it for that bucket. Oops. I'm glad I didn't get your shoes. So I'm going to do the same thing with another series of pots with a different base glaze. So I will need to put this bucket back and haul another bucket out. And actually I will need your help with that. We're going to set that right back on there. Thank you for doing this with me. I should put my mask back on. Oops. You didn't know you were going to have to do this, huh? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. I can see you in the 
Sorry? I can see the settling. Yeah, 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 the waters. And it happens really quickly. If you're just sort of grazing too many in a row and you don't stop and stir it. Is it kind of muddy at the bottom? Or? Yeah, at the moment it's really, um, it's really thick. It's really uh, almost solid. Okay, so, yeah. Some of them settle more than others. This one is not a particularly strong settling glaze, but some of them, if you just leave them for like 10 minutes, they're back down to really thick at the bottom, watery on top. And which color is this? This is called Brown's Celadon. Brown is a last name, not a color. And I can show you what it looks like. Hang on a minute. Brown's Celadon. Uh, they all put away. Yeah. Thank you. This is uh, this is the glaze. She's she has sprayed. This is Becky's pot. She sprayed other colors on top of it, but it's that kind of pretty green um, celadon. I'm going to put this on pots, and then I'm going to spray other colors on top of it, like she's done here. Thank you. You're welcome. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> I think maybe part of what, what happened with those ones on the top that are dull is yeah. that it was a little cool on top. It was thin on top? No, it was cool on top. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I think it was, yeah, in the firing. Because that, that happened to me. I had uh, at the top back on one of my firings, I had a bunch of the um, uh, chucks that just yeah. ended up looking a little dull. Yeah. And I refired it and the kiln went hotter it up. and it yeah. brightened up. So that might, that's one possibility for those ones that you were disappointed I wonder, about. I wonder if I could spray more, warm them up, spray them with something and put them back You can't hurt to try. I know, right? What harm? If you don't like them. I don't like them. Then why not try? I'm carefully stirring this up, but I realize I don't have the pots out here yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. I'm going to get a couple here. I'll do this. No, I don't want on that one. I'll be right back. <laughs> Not quite in the right sequence here. So ordinarily when I'm going to glaze a bunch of pots, I put them on different tables and I write on pieces of paper exactly what I intend to do so I don't forget part way through. Mm -hmm. In this case, that's a little, I have fewer than usual to glaze, and I made the decisions yesterday, and I'm just counting on my memory. Yeah. Never a good idea. <laughs> Never a good plan. And I, you will actually get to see the earlier process too, because I have, um, in the electric kiln right now, I have a bunch of pots that have been first fired or bisque fired, and I'm going to unload a few of them and clean them off and wax them, to it. so you can, you can see that part too. Do you always make it a point to decide the coloring in advance of when you do all of your... I do. do I do. I do. I mean, there's always a, there are always a few little pots at the end where I just go, ah, and okay. dip them in a bucket. But I do a much better job if I decide in advance. I really plan it out. Um, and I plan, and I usually have enough pots that I have to plan it out and also write it down. In this case, I just, I'm, you know, I'm partly relying on memory, but I, I always decide in advance. Um, if I don't, then they just... Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, and I keep pretty good notes of what I've done so that I know I can go back next time and go, oh, that came out well, oh, I really don't like that, you know, whatever. I, I'm, I should have my glaze notebook right here writing this down, although so far <laughs> I've made these decisions and I'm doing something I've done many times before, so maybe I, maybe I don't need to. Never a good idea. This glaze dries more quickly than the first one I did, so you can do both parts closer together. So that's a celadon. 
and I'm going to spray different colors on top of it. And if you can see where it's overlapped there, with some glazes that registers very, very differently. The celadon tends to self-unify, so there's not going to be much difference between where it's thinner and where it's thicker. There'll be a little bit, but not, but, but some glazes, like the Shaner, the first one I used, that one goes a completely different color where it's thicker and where it's thinner. So it's, a, it's more of a, if you want it to be the same color, you have to be more systematic about getting it that way. Or, or you can play with that, that thickness variation as a decorative thing. The other thing is to be careful to keep the berry bowl that goes with the plate together so you, when, you, when you do the next thing to them, you do the same thing. Oops, so I missed right there. When I do the second part, I'll have to make sure I get that. You've got a chorus of crows in your soundtrack. You already know when you, are, you do what you're dipping and you're spraying, but what other controls do you have over the eventual color of the... Hmm. I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, uh, because I, I think I remember you saying something about the, the firing of it. Oh, well, that, in, 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 in particular, there's a glaze called Chino, where the firing has a huge influence. The, the carburation, the amount of um, carbon in the kiln has a huge influence on the color. It goes everywhere from orange to almost black because of carbon trap. I'm, I, I'm not actually doing any Chino in this firing. When I do that glaze, I do the whole kiln or as much of it as I can in Chino because um, you have to go a little bit hotter and you have to get the kiln a little bit dirtier than um, for a Chino firing. And this next firing that I'm doing, I'm actually doing half the kiln in my pots and half the kiln in Becky's pots. We're, but we're both sort of uh, moving along toward the next digital craft fair that's coming up. So we're trying to, and I had a lot of firing and Becky didn't get much chance to do it this summer. So we're trying to make sure she gets all the pots that she has made fired. So I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm just not going to put any Chino at all in this firing. It's kind of an all or nothing thing because the, I get the kiln hotter and I do a great deal more carburation, uh, uh, dirtier, I get it really hot and dirty and that uh, catches carbon smoke in the glaze. That's my favorite, that's my favorite glaze that I use. Also the most fickle. <laughs> it can be really good and it can be really ugh. These are more reliable. But I do, I, um, the other thing about firing with Chino is that after you have glazed the pots, um, you can affect the color by either wrapping them in plastic or putting wax on them or how you dry it. Um, because it has um, something called soda ash in it, which migrates to the surface. And it's that st sticky stuff on the surface that creates that carbon trap. So, um, so that, that, that also requires glazing the pots and then waiting a week, 10 days, two weeks, or whatever for all that stuff to migrate before you fire. And we're on a, <laughs> we're on a tighter schedule than that, so we're just, I'm just not doing that this time. This is a pot that has a, a texture in it. So I'm going to, ch I, I didn't realize it was one of those. I'm going to, I'm going to use a glaze on this that does really well falling into grooves like that. So I, I, I carried it out here, but I'm going to put it aside, both of these, to use a glaze which really goes down into the grooves. And I can show you an example of that fire. I'm going to grab two more that aren't like that.
Yeah, I'll just do it anyway. <laughs> Have you ever worked with clay at all? Uh, I haven't since middle school. That was the, that was uh. the only time I ever did. Pretty fun. Um, I work in series, so I sit down in the morning knowing what I'm planning to make, and I usually make a, several of them in a row. I don't, I very rarely make just one of something. It's, a, it takes a little, um, there's this lovely thing that happens after you've throwing, been throwing for a little while in a, in a session, where you begin to, I don't want to say go on automatic and it, because that has a negative connotation, but you, you, you be, things just begin to flow and you know one follows the other follows the other and it, it, it creates a both psychologically and also physically it just creates a real flow in the work and I can't do that if I'm switching from one, one shape to another to another. It takes me a while to get into the flow of whatever I'm making. So I sit down and to work having already weighed and measured my clay, prepared and, and measured, you know, measured my clay, and then I make the same thing repeatedly. They're not identical to each other, but they're the same basic form. And and when I'm working on bowls, I work on bowls for a week or two. I mean, I just concentrate on bowls because good bowls have a continuing flow on the inside that's hard for me to get going, and so I have to make a few, and then then it begins to happen. And I find it I find it difficult to go back and forth between bowls and cylinders. Well, I don't find it difficult, I just don't do it. <laughs> if I were to do it, I would find it difficult. These little guys are kiln gods. I make two of them each time I fire and stand them up on top of the kiln. And then um, uh, then, then I bisque fire them and then I glaze fire them. It's a superstition thing. And I have, uh, I can show you, I have some kiln gods that came with me. I have one that came with me all the way from England where I first learned to make pots. Um, a friend of mine made them when we were in art school together. And he stood on every kiln I've ever fired. I don't, I don't, I think I might have to stop firing if anything ever happened to that kiln god. No, I mean, not really, but sort of, you know, I don't, I, I, <laughs> and the idea of using that, is that something you borrowed or something you just sort of, that, where I, you mean using kiln gods? Yeah. Get, come here and I'll show you a, my, my, uh, my uber kiln god. Um, where I went to school in England, um, people, some people put them on kilns. So this is, this is the fellow that came back from England with me. My friend Toff Will Millway made it. This is one I made 25 years ago. This is a more recent one that a friend of mine made. But these are the little ones. So every time I fire, I put two new, new little ones up here. Up here includes some made by me, some made by Becky, my firing partner. This is a first tend to be doing yoga. <laughs> the one she just took out of her kiln had the one she just took out of her kiln had Black Lives Matter on it, uh, um, the one, or it had Vote, and the, the one that's in there right now, I think, you know, the next one has Black Lives Matter. Uh, but these I, I don't sell, I give away. So back when I had people coming to visit my studio regularly, I would, you know, I'd just usually kids, but adults too, I'd just give them away. It would be very, very bad juju to <laughs> sell them, I think. And then some of these are also made by another friend. These little ones that look like Buddhist monks. They're, um, she calls them Jizos, and she's a, she does a lot of meditation, and they're little meditation objects. So, and they stand, the two kiln gods stand right there, and they are facing the flame. There, it, it is formulaic, which is, <laughs> which all superstition is, right? <laughs> so, since you're in here, this is, hang on get rid of the noise. This is the electric kiln where you do the first firing, which is called the bisque firing. 
So these pots went in raw, like this. If you put this pot into a bucket of water, it would melt back down. Um, but these have now been fired. They're still a little too hot to touch. The first firing, it's turned them from being clay to being ceramic. It's driven out the chemically combined water. So these, no matter how much you put them in water, they'll never, they'll never slick down. Um, so you do this, and then um, when they're cool enough to touch, um, you take them out, you clean them, you wax the bottoms, and then they're ready to glaze. So, and I fired this yesterday, opened it 20 minutes ago, and it is now. It says it's 222 in there, but it's, it's, de it's definitely not that hot because I can touch it. It was about 250 when I opened it, um, which is right at the top of when I'm willing to open them. I probably might not have opened it even that quickly, except I wanted to let you see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but, so you, you said this one, or this one, I fi I, fi I loaded and fired yesterday. But the other ones that, that you said that you pulled out were 100 degrees. The 150, so yeah, 150. yeah, yeah, and that was after. 30 some hours of cooling. This kiln gets a lot hotter than the bisque kiln. The bisque kiln, this has been fired to, um, oh shoot, I was thinking Celsius. Uh, it's been fired to about 980 Celsius, which I think is 18 something Fahrenheit. And this one fires to 1300 Celsius or 2240 or something like that. I, I, I don't, 2240, something like that. So that's, there's a big difference. This is still porous. These are these are fully fired, but but they're still porous. So if you if you get them wet, you can see that the moisture will soak in, and that's why you can glaze the, these because they, they they sort of suck in the moisture out of the glaze, which is why when I'm dipping them in something wet, they dry so quickly because the moist the bisque is you know pulling that moisture out of the pot. Um, so we'll let them dry a little longer, and then I'll clean some of them off and. You can see that part of the process too. So what would happen if you did happen to take them out to? It's bad for the kiln. Bad for the kiln. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> I've taught various places where we've unloaded kilns when they were really hot because students had to leave. Right. You know, one time we, I was teaching at a place called John Campbell Folk School, and there was a snowstorm blew up and they sent everybody home a day early, and we had we were firing pots thinking everyone was leaving on Saturday morning and suddenly Thursday evening we had to leave. And we took those pots out when they were so hot. I mean, the kiln was done, but they were so hot that when we put them on the table afterwards, there were little burn rings. <laughs> I was embarrassed. I should have put them on the concrete floor. But it's not great. It's not good for the kilns. It, I think at that, at, at that temperature with the pots, sorry about that, at that temperature with the pots, I don't know that it really affects the pots very much. Okay. You know, all of my pots can go into a, a, an oven. So it's my theory that if it's less than 350 or 400 degrees, it's the same as taking them out of an oven with a cake in them. You know, and it, you, they can do that that transition. Uh, in fact, um, the way um, I don't I don't recommend that people do this, but the way that I test them is I put them into a very hot oven, take them out and put cold water on them, or put, take them out of the freezer and pour boiling water on them to just make sure they're not going to crack. I don't, I don't tell my customers they should do that, but, um, but that's how I test them. I've got to find the lid and get another glaze going here. I don't know what I did with the lid. Here it is. I, in fact, what I might do is, uh, give me a minute, let me feel those pots, and if they're cool enough, I'll, I'll clean a couple of them next. So this is brown celadon. And I will write a little note to remember, because it is getting complicated. Now, the, I guess, so when you fire them the second time, they lose that porousness? That the That's right. They is become, they, they vitrify. The yeah. It, it, uh, no, it's a function of the clay getting close okay. to being glass. So they vitrify. So if you put an unglazed pot into the, my stoneware kiln and pull it out, even if it has no glaze on it, it still won't take any water on. The clay has gotten vitrified enough that it's it's uh, not porous. I'm going to write a note about what that is, lest I forget.
when I'm when I'm glazing lots of pots at once, I have all these tables full of pots, and I, I, I put them all out, and then I put them in glaze groups, and then I write on the table <laughs> what the glaze group is, so I don't so I don't get mixed up, and even anyway, I still get mixed up, but I'm you know I'm trying to I'm trying not to. Let's see here. Seventeen. No, they're still a little too warm. Um, this shouldn't hurt my hands. So I'll, well, I'll, I'll glaze another set and then then I'll pull them out. You learned in England. Did, did uh, pottery take you to England, or no? How did that happen? No, and no, not at all. I had never made pots when I went to England. Let me pull these out here, and I'll. Can I talk to you as I go? Um, so I actually um, actually took a year off from college to go to England to try to apply to theater school. Oh. And, um, and I did apply to theater school. I got accepted to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. But meanwhile, I went to dinner at the parents of a friend of mine from college. And she was a potter. And I stayed overnight and started making pots and just dove into it, fell into it, did it. I, I became. I guess I would say obsessed with it. Uh, it was a, it was just love at first sight. So I stayed at their house making pots for about I guess January to June or July. And meanwhile, I applied to pottery school in England. I applied to the Harrow School of Art, which had a great pottery program. Then I did some other stuff over the summer and came back, and it was a two-year program. So I was there a total of about three years. Between my first and second year in the pottery program, I worked in a pottery in Ireland. And when I was done, I worked um, for a little while helping some friends set up their studios. So I was, I, I, had, never, I had never worked with clay. I had been a, a theater person. I'd done, I wanted to be a director. Um, and uh, that, was, that had been my goal for, for the longest time, really. Clay won out, and there was this moment in my life when I had been accepted to theater school, and I had been accepted to, um, I was waiting to hear if I'd been accepted to pottery school, but I had to decide what, what to do. It was a sort of, you know, two roads diverged kind of moment in my life, and I had been working in theater. I had worked, I had worked at, um, in semi-professional theater and in college theater and various places, and all the people who I worked with in theater were wonderful, creative, neurotic, insecure people <laughs> who never knew where their next you know job was going to come from and they they were all on their second or third relationship or marriage and they, they had very you know uh, anxious urban lives mm -hmm. and I started meeting all these potters who were all married to their first spouses and lived out in the country and you know just were seemed very grounded very very grounded people um, that sounds like a pun but they really were and I just thought, do I want to be that, or do I want to be that? I was 19 years old, but I was smart enough to realize that what excited me about theater also frightened me. Um, that was the, the constant, constant having to, you know, you finish, and film too, uh, you finish a project and, you know, you're, you're always auditioning for the next thing. I mean, you, I, we, we watched something not long ago where Dustin Hoffman was talking about auditioning for the next part and the anxiety of that and I thought you know I mean I hadn't watched that back then but it's just always this constant whereas you know that when you make pottery yeah, there's, a, there's a question about whether you can sell it especially during a pandemic but it's very um, cyclic and uh, soothing the reason I have so many pots around is because in these very anxious times the way I stay grounded and centered in, in myself is to work on the wheel. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's very, very, very deeply um, centering. Uh, it does, uh, uh, apologies for the pun, but it, but it really is. Um, so that's, that's why, that's why I, when I was 19 and trying to decide which school to go to, I went to pottery school. Okay, I need a few more pots here to glaze in the next glaze which is going to be, I need these textured ones. So 
so let's just hope this doesn't melt my table. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it will. I can touch it. Becky, have you had pots melt your plastic tables ever? Uh, no, but burn wood. Yeah. 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 Haven't done the plastic. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of, my, one of my tables. I pulled the pot out once. And uh, afterwards, I realized there was a little ring where it had kind of wow. sunk down a little bit. <laughs> um, and I also had the experience of loading, uh, loading up a bunch of pots once for a show in Washington, D.C. Early morning, early morning, unloaded my kiln, threw the pots into um, newsprint and boxes in the back of my car and drove to a show in D.C., you know, got up at 4.30 in the morning to get there to tent, for the you know, and I got there. And the newsprint was all singed. I was so lucky that I didn't get. Was that? I think it was just because it was anaerobic. It was so close up. Otherwise, the back of my car would have been on fire. Yeah, boy, stupid. <laughs> but I think these are cool enough. I'm not going to do that. So I want to show you since since we're doing, explaining it, I want to show you how I clean these off and wax the bottoms. It's a several part process. I, I blow the dust off them and then I sponge them with a clean sponge and then I put wax on the bottom and then, then they will be like this one is. The glaze will resist on the bottom. It's going to take a minute to set this up so you might want to just take a break. Bye. I'm glad you got that all done. Oh, yeah, me too. And I'm glad there were su such good results. And we're going to see her folks on the newsletter because that's the other big hang up in my life. Yeah, it'll happen. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Michael, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Enjoy. Good luck with your project. Thank you. So, I spray this with compressed air, and actually, I, I will. I do, I do wear a mask when I do this. <laughs> I have a, a, an official respirator, dust respirator, that I use for spraying glazes and things like that, not just a little cloth mask, but this is fine for a few of them. So typically, I would unload a whole bisque kiln. I'd put them all out here, outside usually, if the weather permits, on the table, spray them all, clean them all, wax them all, and then, then I divide them into different uh, glaze families. And if there are uh, little goobers I've left on there and failed, neglected to get off, I can still get them off at this point with a little diamond pad. <laughs> Typically, I try and get them really cleaned up before I put them in the bisque kiln so they, you know, the bottom's smooth and every, all the sharp edges uh, under control. But in this case, it looks like I just kind of hurried the process a bit. Yeah, it's okay. These are lamps. Um, so that's what I do first, and then I get some really clean water, this bucket's very clean, and I, any dust that might be left on them after, after spraying it off, I get off with a sponge and clean water. And if you don't do this, if you don't get your bisque clean, so you can see a little bit of dust coming off. Um, then uh, you, it create, you can, you can uh, get glaze problems, pinholing and stuff like that. I don't, I don't need this. I'm not spraying. Um, it, you, you got it, you've got to work with it. So that, that's another thing about working with a great number of pots at once. For many years, I had really large kilns. So I got in the habit of creating a great number of pots um, before I would do any glazing or, you know, any, any, uh, take them to the next spot. But this kiln's really small, and I haven't exactly learned how to, when to stop. 
<laughs> in my making. So, uh, you know, but, but if you have a lot of pots to deal with at once, that you're more efficient with glazing, you know, because you can do entire groups. If you want variety, you can do, do more at once. Can, can you see the yeah. dust coming off? Um, so some people actually run, you know, wash their pots off under running water. And that would be fine if you, if you do it, if you time it enough in advance that um, they have time to pull, fully dry. But if they're damp and then you glaze them, well, it's really, really just dusty. If they're damp and you glaze them, then the glaze won't absorb in at the right, um, you know, you have, to, you have to calibrate it differently. And so I like to have them be dry. But I, what I was going to say is that sometimes if I clean off a whole bunch of pots, dust them off and get them ready to gla glaze, and then take a long time glazing them, they'll get dusty again in the kiln shed. Yeah. So I will, I will sometimes clean off of them, put them on one of my rare carts, and then cover the whole thing in plastic, just so it doesn't get, get dusty. This is a lamp. And there's a piece of, there's a sharp piece of clay in there that I didn't, must, it must have just stuck. Now, if this were anything other than a lamp, I would take the time to grind that off. I think since no hands except mine are ever going to go inside this lamp, it, it probably doesn't matter. But if it were inside any kind of a pot where someone else was going to be putting their hands, I would, I would take, take that off. I'm very concerned with um, how my pots function. That's really where I start and come from with making pots. I want people to be able to use them and um, have them work well. So having a, sh a sharp little goober inside would <laughs> not work well. Okay. So that's the, that's the next thing I do. The next thing I do, I have to do in the kiln shed because that's where my frying pan is, but you can, I can show you. I think the hardest thing for me about being a potter um, is nothing to do with making the pots, it's marketing them. I think um, that's, the, that's the part that doesn't, that doesn't come easily to me and that I don't enjoy and that I'm not particularly good at. Um, okay, just, so this is an electric frying pan and that's going to take about three or four minutes to melt. This is um, paraffin wax like this you know, canning wax, golf wax. Um, the potters I know who burned down their studios <laughs> did it with this stuff. It's not, it's, it's, it's not so very safe. You don't want to breathe the fumes, so I always do it in the open air rather than indoors. And you don't ever want to walk away from it and leave it heating. This, this is an electric frying pan, so it's only going to get but so hot, but you just, that's, uh, it's still, I mean, we don't use it where I teach in, in schools. They don't use it because it's just a little too r risky. But, uh, you know, I'm 50 years in and I haven't burned down my studio yet, so <laughs> I figure. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, like anything, if you keep an eye on it, you know what you're doing and you're careful, it's probably okay. As far as marketing things go, uh, do you consider well, uh, both. Um, I think I think people know what to do with the mug. Right. You know, they they don't they. It's not an alien thing. It's on the other hand, you can buy really nice mugs made in China for a fraction of what I can make them for. So it takes a kind. It sort of takes a certain kind of person who's willing to spend way more money than they need to on a mug. Um, they, um, it's just what interests me. It's what I want to do, so that's why I do it. 
Um, I, if, you, if you make a pot that's going to go in a kitchen, people have a certain kind of, I think, mental limit on how much that thing is worth. But if you make something that's going to go on a wall or on a mantle, it, and it's more art, um, it, it jumps into a different, um, different realm. And I never have jumped that realm, and I never have been that interested in jumping it. I mean, I wouldn't mind making more money, but it's not why I'm doing it. You know, I really want people to, I really want to keep these affordable so people can use them. I really want to enrich people's everyday lives with everyday objects. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy, craft and art. I mean, you know, this, uh, you do this long enough, you can get lo lots of discussions like that. But my interest is in, in functional, so that's what I do. Um, as far as marketing it goes, I mean, I, the, the most successful years of my marketing were when I owned a gallery. Um, I was one of the owners of a gallery, and I sold all my pots there, and they sold, you know, I could, I could sell as many as I could make. But, you know, owning a gallery, although it was a very lovely experience and I had a wonderful partner named Sue who really did much of the work, um, I was spending a lot of my time selling other people's work. And since I don't like selling work to begin with, you know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a mixed bag. I'm going to grab those two things I just cleaned. I'll be right back. So as I say, ordinarily I would, um, I would say that's going to smoke for a minute, try not to breathe it, and then it, it stops after a minute. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't keep doing that. That's not healthy. <laughs> that, that, uh, you don't want to breathe those fumes. So it, it gets on the bottom. It, it prevents the glaze from going there. You don't absolutely have to, you know, and you don't. You shouldn't dip it up the way I just did because it ran up the side there. That was bad. Keep it, keep it upright. Don't do what I just did. Oh, stupid. Um, that's too bad. So I now my choice with that is I can say, okay, I really like that. I wanted that to be raw right there. Or if I if it if I get too discouraged by having made that mistake and tipping it up. I can refire that and that will burn it off. But that's the only way to get that wax off of there is to rebiscuit. So keep it upright. Don't tip it up to show anyone. And uh, after a little while, when it's not as runny, then you can set it on the counter. So I think I will, you know, in this case, because this is my last firing of the fall, maybe, I'll probably just pretend I did that on purpose. <laughs> what will happen there is that no matter how much glaze I put on here, it's right there will remain waxed, and so it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't settle on those spots. Uh, if you didn't glaze it at all, and you fired a second time, would the color remain constant, or would it be slightly different? It would look like this. This is this clay unglazed in the kiln. And this is, a, this is a little demo I did for some students. Um, I can explain it. Um, when you fire it as hot as I do, and you put spouts on things, they tend to tw untwist slightly as you fire. So I made this just to show this was put on, you know. So when, so when you make something like a teapot, you need to, instead of cutting at cone 10, Instead of just cutting it, if you cut it flat, it tends to twist and be tilted. So w this was a way to show people what they could do on in their own kiln to figure out it was it was cut like that and did it go level? You know, ha how do you need to cut it for it to end up level? And that's that's what I, that's what sort of works for me. I cut it with my left hand slightly down, and it straightens up. If you cut it with your right hand slightly down. It goes even more. <laughs> so, but that, but this is but but that to answer your question, this is what the clay looks like um, without any glaze on it. And the difference between that and that, I can't explain exactly, except except that's just what it did. Okay. So. Do you 
use pretty much use your own pottery exclusively? No, I, no. I we, we 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 eat almost exclusively on handmade pottery, but it's not all mine. I, I, over the years, I've, I've got a lot of friends who are potters, and we, we barter and we trade, and you know, I, 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 my, our dinner plates were made by a, a friend who's no longer alive named Schatz. We got them a long time ago, at wedding presents actually, and um, they we're still using them. And, um, they, this, and if you don't drop it, the stuff, high-fired stoneware holds up really well. So I do, we do literally eat out of some pots that I made when I first set up my first studio in Crozet in 1973. Um, but mostly, I, you know, mostly the old ones aren't as good as the new ones, so, <laughs> you know, over the years, you know. I'd say probably in terms of what's up decoratively in our house, and I can show you if you'd like, um, it's probably 80% other people's work and 20% mine. But in terms of what we use every day, it's, that probably flips. 80% of it's mine and 20% other people. Yeah, so, something along those lines. Mine's, um, cheaper and easier to come by. <laughs> so these pots right here are glazed in um, a glaze called Korean white. And uh, I really am liking the way that looks with spray on it right now. That's what I had out the other day. But, the, but I'm, that I'm intending to do more of the ones that are in the bis kiln right now in Korean white. Um, and I, I don't know, in terms of your schedule, Michael, I don't know whether you want to you know, I don't, I don't know what's best to, how to move forward with this. Um, we could, is it, I make a bunch of these little boxes. Um, they're fun to make and they're uh, affordable. Um, it's a particularly difficult time to market right now, of course, because, you know, nobody's going to stores. Um, not if they're smart. Um, while this is still hot, I'll just get the bottom of this. The wax, I've unplugged it, but the wax stays hot for a little while. Um, so everything you glaze, you have to make sure that not, no glaze touches any glaze. So I need to either dip this edge and fire these separately, or make sure there's no glaze either here or here and fire them together, which, uh, which I will, I'll fire this one together because it's a tight fit and the thickness of, of glaze on there might make it so it no longer fits. If it had a little wiggle in it, I would fire them, probably fire them separately because it's easier to glaze. Okay, what can I? And you're saying, I think I have probably about 15 more minutes. Yeah, you want to look around at pots in the house? Sure. So, I mean, with, what, whatever you want. I, uh, yeah, um, I'm, I, that would be nice. Yeah, be okay. Uh, we can go through the studio. I don't know. People want to see the studio. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what your, you know, what your film hopes are here, but uh, this is my studio, and it's looking unusually empty because my husband Carter has very kindly let me store my carts full of pots that are for sale in his in his space. Oh. So I'll show you I'll show you that too. <coughs> Usually this. Usually this area looks a lot more crowded, but I have my pots out to be glazed, and and Carter let me put two carts in here, so come in. I have two wheels. I have a slab roller, and a pug mill. Pug mill processes the clay, so you don't have to do it by hand. And I buy my clay in uh, fifty-pound boxes. That's a half a ton of clay right there, more or less. Minus one box. I buy it typically a half a ton at a time. I just got some. I'll show you my. I'll show you the pots in my online store. This is Carter's workspace. He's a cabinet maker um, and a woodworker, and he very generously has let me keep my online store in here because I I, I was getting so crowded out. So I have. Um, I was telling you that I, I, I typically use gla choose glazes that, that run well down into cracks. This is one of the ones that I'm going to put on some of the, those lamps that have a lot of texture. Um, and I also mentioned that I do a lot of spraying. So uh, 
it's not actually. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, this is a pot with a bunch of different sprayed glazes on it. So this this is a pot that was glazed just as I did that one in the in initially in the celadon, mm -hmm. and then I sprayed different colors on it. So you get a lot of variation. So all these pots are in my are in my online store, and um, I have been selling some, you know. But there, you know, you can see that I've made a lot more yeah, than yeah. <laughs> this. This these are pandemic pots. <laughs> I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them. Ordinarily, I spend three days a week teaching, two or three days a week teaching, and two or three days a week making pots. And um, I haven't done any teaching, so I've had a lot more time. And also, as I think I said before, throwing, making, working with my hands keeps me from anxiety. Mm -hmm. So it's been an anxious time, and I've made a lot of pots. <laughs> so, we talked about that carbon trap chino. This is that glaze um, with um, a color variation because of how thick I sprayed. I've sprayed, it, I've sprayed some more on it, and where it goes thicker, it tends to carbon trap more. It goes everything from this color, which I really love, to just bright orange, which I also like. But I like it best of all when it does this, which is this kind of smoky gray color trap. And that's the smoke that's been caught by the glaze. I just think that's gorgeous. Yeah. That was just luck. <laughs> yeah, and this is a white chino, but the same thing. It, it, sometimes it comes out just white, and sometimes when you get lucky, it carbon traps and you get that smoky gray color. I really like that's my that's my personal favorite glaze. Although I do like the blue, you know, the range that you get with the spraying with the different blue glazes. I like this quite a lot. Um, so, yeah. Got pots coming out of my ears, and and not and no really good ideas of how to sell them. Like the the studio, the artisan studio tour is November 14th, 13th, 14th, or something like that, and that's going to be a digital show. And I do have my online store, but basically, most of the ways I used to sell pots aren't available right now. You know, galleries are barely open, and I usually have a couple of shows a year myself, and that's not happening. And then I also take pots when I teach workshops, and that's not happening. So, so I have a lot of pots. <laughs> oh, look, let's look at the pots upstairs. Yeah, I think you missed that last time. Kai. Uh, yeah, Kai, Kai came and made a little video. Just I think I sent you the. Yeah. yeah. I did a good job. Sweet man. I met Kai when he was nine hours old. Is he a musician? He is. Yeah. He's a musician and a filmmaker. So, um, yeah, maybe more like less than 80 20. But the pots that we have on display in our living room, um, some of them are very old. Uh, some of them are made by my teachers, some of them are mine. Just a lot of them around. Um, the display pots tend to be tend to be other people's. So we have a lot. We have a lot of pots. Let me get this lovely little thing out of here. So of these, uh, that's mine. That's you know three or four of them are mine, but mostly they're made by friends and teachers, and some of them are old, as in you know um, Civil War era. Yeah. But um, the ones we eat out of, by contrast, are a lot of these are mine. These are the ones the wedding present I've mentioned. Oh, yeah, had yeah, those. We got 12, we still have 10, and that was 1976. They hold up well. These are mine. These tend to be mine. 
mostly mine. Not entirely, but mostly mine. Um, you know, those are mostly mine. Uh, although I do have, you know, in this cabinet, I do have mugs made by other people as well. But we tend to use mine because I don't, I'm not as heartbroken when they break. Right. You know, some of these people are old and dear friends and they're not even making pots anymore and I, I don't want to break their pots. <laughs> so. and, then, and then these are the ones we mostly cook with. Take the plastic off. You know, mix, bake, whatever. And the, the teapots? Oh, the teapots, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's mine, that's a friend. You met Michael before, didn't you? I did, I don't want to get your picture, though. <laughs> you're okay. I think you're okay. I think you're okay. So. I don't know. I don't know what else you want to do. Um, It's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. Oh, I should show you this. <laughs> just, just in case I didn't make it clear, I have too many pots. <laughs> These are the ones that aren't in the online store. <laughs> I do have this problem. <laughs> Some people have it with, you know, collection or whatever. I just have too many pots. So. And there are more in that closet too, but that's okay. <laughs>